In this video, we're going to talk about ionic formulas and nomenclature. So in class, we've done the puzzle activity where you looked at how you figure out the formulas for ionic compounds. It's kind of complicated, so I wanted to just go back through and talk about some examples, and then we're going to talk about how to name things. So the first thing we have to think about when we write ionic formulas, um, let's look at an example of a compound made from barium and phosphate ions. We have to figure out the charges on the ions involved. And in order to do that, we have to think about the fact that the atoms gain and lose electrons to become more stable like the noble gases. So when you look at barium, barium tends to lose two electrons, so it tends to get a positive two charge. And when you look at phosphate, phosphate is one of your polyatomic ions, so it has more than one element in it, and it's on your polyatomic ion chart in your reference packet. So take a second and look that up. All right, so hopefully you'll see that you have a negative three charge there. And remember, that negative three charge applies to that entire PO4. It means that that P and the four oxygens all together have uh, three extra electrons. All right, so when we're trying to figure out a formula, we want to find the lowest common multiple of the charges, so the smallest number that both of the numbers from the charge will divide into. So if you think about the least, the smallest number that two and three will go into evenly, you come up with six because it, two will divide into six evenly and so will three. And so in order to have the neutral compound, remember that all ionic compounds have to be neutral, we need a total of six positive charges and six negative charges in order to have that neutral compound. All right, so we want to determine how many of each of the ions to have. So in order to have six total positives, if each one has a plus two, think about how many you'll need. You'll need three barium ions, so three times plus two would give us plus six. And then to get six total negatives, if each ion has a negative three charge, you would need two of the phosphate ions. So two times negative three gives you negative six. Plus six minus six, that together equals zero. So in order to write our formula, we just write that with those numbers. So Ba3, the PO4, because it's a polyatomic ion with a subscript outside, we've got to put it in those parentheses. So it's Ba3, PO4 in parentheses, two. So let's write the formula of the following ones. A compound made from aluminum and hydroxide. We're just going to take these one at a time. So t pause the video, look up the charges for each of these ions in these six uh, ions that we're using in the three examples. So hopefully you figured out that aluminum loses three electrons so it gets a three plus charge and hydroxide is one of your polyatomic ions it has a charge of minus one or one minus and it doesn't matter whether you write the sign first or second it's uh I, my habit is to write it after the number but it's up to you so think about the least common multiple of three and one hopefully you realize that it's three so in order to have a plus three we'll need one aluminum and in order to make negative three, we'll need three hydroxides. Since that's a polyatomic ion, we've got to put it in parentheses before we can put that subscript on. And that's our neutral compound. All right, so hopefully you figured out that the charge for magnesium is two plus, and the charge for sulfur is two minus. And the smallest number that both two and two will divide into is two. And so we just need one of each of those, M, G, S. And then strontium, strontium gets a two plus charge. Nitrite, now be really careful when you look these up on your polyatomic ion charts because there's nitrate, nitrite, and there'll also be nitride. We're gonna talk about that. So nitrite is NO2 with a one minus charge. 
So you're going to have the least common multiple of 2 and 1 is 2. So it's SR and O2 with a subscript of 2. Don't forget those parentheses. Okay? You only need them if you have to put a subscript outside of the parentheses. If we just needed one nitrite or one hydroxide, we wouldn't use the parentheses. All right, let's look at some more. So when we're naming ionic compounds, it's based on us knowing that the charges, what the charges of the ions are. And sometimes we know and sometimes we don't. We have to figure it out. It doesn't tell us anything about how many of each ion there are in the compound. It's just based on the charges, which makes it kind of tricky. All right, so here are the rules. I'm going to have you leave a few gaps in here. I'll tell you where. All right, so always name the positive ion first. Typically, it's a metal, but it can be a positive polyatomic ion. So let's use the example of sodium. Sodium with a plus one charge would be a sodium ion, just named sodium. Leave a couple of lines blank there. You're going to fill it in later. And then we ne name that negative ion last. We change the name of a monatomic anion to have an IDE ending. So those are all of those ions on the periodic table. Things like chlorine, that becomes chloride. Uh, sulfur becomes sulfide. And oxygen becomes oxide. Nitrogen becomes nitride. Tellurium becomes telluride. So all of those endings will change to IDE. If you have a polyatomic ion, one that you have to look up on the reference table, those do not change. We never change the name or the charge on a polyatomic ion. All right, so let's try a couple of practice problems here. So let's name the following list. So what you need to do is you need to look up the names of each of those elements. So for the first one, remember that we name the positive ion first. So the positive ion there is barium. And we always write them with a positive ion first. So you're going to know the name by writing the, that first element as the positive ion. And then we're, the second part, the anion, the negative ion, is chlorine, but we want to change that to IDE, so chloride, barium chloride. All right, let's try this next one. Hopefully you recognize that Mg is magnesium. And then the second element is oxygen, but because it's the negative ion, we're going to change it to IDE, so it is oxide. All right, try this one yourself. Pause. Okay, so hopefully you recognize that Na is sodium. And P is phosphorus. That Remember to change it to IDE, so it's going to be phosphide. All right. And try this last one. Pause the video. All right, so again, aluminum is our positive ion. And then SO4, you should have looked this up on your polyatomic ion chart. That is sulfate. We do not change the name of this at all. Remember that sulfur is, uh, when it's the, a monatomic ion, it becomes sulfide. So if you change this to sulfide, you would be confused about which one you had. So we always leave sulfate like it is. Now, the other tricky thing is that we now will have sulfate, sulfite, and sulfide. You'll also have nitrate, nitrite, nitride. So you really have to pay attention to the name in the formula or to what you write down when you go ahead and give it a name. All right, let's try a couple more. Let's look at something else. So those stupid d orbitals, they aggravate us when we have to do electron configurations, and they're back to bother us again. They make this stuff tricky. So let's look at these two copper oxides. There's CuO, 
and there's Cu2O. Figure out the charge on the copper ions in both of those compounds, the black one and in the red one. I'm, I expect you to pause. All right, so let's look at the charge on the first one, the CuO. All right, I'm going to click this down so we can see a little better. So with CuO, we don't know the charge of the copper. Remember with the transition metals and the F-block metals, we don't know those charges. We just know group 1 and group 2 from the metals and aluminum. So, well, silver, zinc, and aluminum. But copper is one of the ones that we don't know the charge of. We do, however, know the charge of the oxygen. The charge of the oxygen is 2 minus. And we know if we add up the two charges together that it's going to be a neutral compound because it's an ionic compound and they have to be neutral. So what would I have to add to negative 2 to make that neutral? Hopefully you're saying positive 2. So the copper in this black copper oxide is a 2 plus. Now look at this one. We have to look at this one. It's a little bit different because there are two coppers. Again, we know that this oxygen is a 2 minus, but we've got this copper, and overall there needs to be a plus 2 charge in order to make that a neutral compound. But if we have two coppers, then each one is going to be a 1 plus. So the copper in this red oxide is Cu with a 1 plus charge. If you're struggling with that and you'd like me to explain it in class, just remind me when you come in. All right, so we can have metals that are multivalent, and hopefully you recognize that, that breakdown of that word. Multi means many, valent implies valence electrons. So what happens is most of those metals can have a lot of different charges because of those d orbitals. The ones that can only have one charge are group 1, which is plus 1, group 2, which is plus 2, and you already know those. And then silver is always plus 1, zinc is always plus 2, and aluminum is always plus 3. And there's a trick for remembering those three. Silver is in group 11, so if you cover up the first one, it's plus 1. Zinc is diagonally up to the right, and it is in group 12. If you cover up the 1, it's a plus 2. Aluminum is in group 13, again, diagonally up and to the right. And then it has a plus 3 charge. It's in group 13. So if you remember to just cover up that first digit of the group number, it tells you what the charge is for those three, and I will expect you to know that. For everything else, we've got to specify the charge in the name of the compound so that we know which particular uh, charge that metal has. So what we use is a Roman numeral to tell us the charge. And I need to just jot down these Roman numerals for you because if you haven't seen them before, you'll want to know them. And you will need to memorize these. Okay, so for remember for Roman numerals, we use I's. You can do them with or without the little top and bottom. So one I is one. Two I's is two. This is easy so far, hopefully, you think. 3i's is 3. Now here's where it starts getting tricky. 4 is with i and a v, and I'll show you why in a minute. 5 is a v. And so with, num with the Roman numeral for 4, we're saying it's 1 before 5. So that's why the i is before the v. For 6, it's vi, so 1 after v. For 7, it's VII, 2 after 5, so 7. And then 8 is VIII. And those are all the ones that you need to know. And if you think about it, you can probably figure out why. Okay? So make sure you work on memorizing those. Those would be good to put on some flashcards. All right, so let's go back to the rules. You left some gaps. Let's fill those in. So this is what you had on your paper, and you have a little gap we're going to fill in right here. So you name the positive ion first, and then after you write the name of that positive ion, if we don't know the charge, if it's not group 1, group 2, silver, zinc, or aluminum, 
we have to specify the charge of that metal ion with a Roman numeral. So we'll have to write that Roman numeral and you put it in parentheses. And then you name that negative ion last. So you just change the name of the monatomic anion to have an IDE ending. So anything you look up on the periodic table ends in IDE. And then polyatomic ions, the names do not change. So there's where you filled in that little gap there. Remember that you have to know group one is plus one, group two is plus two, silver is plus one, zinc is plus two, aluminum is plus three. All right, so let's go back and look at these compounds again with those stupid d orbitals. Let's name them. So the first one we said had a plus two charge on the copper. So we're gonna call that copper two oxide. So copper with a plus two charge with oxygen. See if you can figure out the name for the red one, pause. All right, so the red one, uh, the copper had a plus one charge, so it would be copper one oxide. It's that simple. Remember that the Roman numeral is the charge on the metal ion, not the number of atoms. And you can always figure out those nonmetals, the charges on those nonmetals. All right, so let's try some practice problems. Let's go ahead and name these compounds. So when you look at this, you see that we've got iron and we've got oxygen. Iron's a transition metal, so we don't know its charge. Oxygen has a two minus charge. So the overall negative charge here is gonna be negative six. So that means that our iron has to provide us with a positive six worth of charge. If I have two irons, think about what the charge should be. It should be three plus. So that's gonna be iron in parentheses Roman numeral three oxide. Don't forget to change the end of that to IDE. All right, let's look at the next one. We've got cobalt and this NO3 is one of your polyatomic ions, it's nitrate. So we don't know the charge on cobalt, but nitrate is a negative one. We have two of those, so our overall negative charge is negative two. In order for this to be a neutral compound, cobalt's going to have to give me a plus two charge. Cobalt already, there's only one, so we know that it's going to be cobalt two, don't forget the Roman numeral, nitrate. Okay, let's try this one. Think about the elements. Calcium, do we know the charge on calcium? Actually, we do. It's a two plus. And carbonate is a two minus. So it's already a neutral compound. Calcium's in group two, so we don't have to name the charge. We're just gonna call that calcium carbonate. Let's try one more. Look at that one. See if you can figure out what's in this. All right, so hopefully you've recognized that this is a polyatomic ion and this is a different polyatomic ion. Ammonium is our only positive polyatomic ion. It's a one plus. And this other big one, C2H3O2, is acetate and it's a one minus. We know the charges on both of those because they're both polyatomic ions. With polyatomic ions, we don't have to name the charge. We're just gonna call that ammonium acetate. All right, we don't need any Roman numerals or anything because we already know the charge. All right, we're gonna practice these ones. Try these at home. And then when you come in, we'll go over them in class together. So write down these four, give them a try so you can see how you do with it. Remember to think about whether you know the charge of the metal, and then if you don't, how to find that Roman numeral. The other thing we need to do is learn how to go from name to formula, because sometimes you're going to have to do that.
All right, so let's do these together. So we have 10, 4 oxide. Let me put the other examples up. So let's go ahead and think about the charges. We know that 10, that IV is that Roman numeral, 10 has a 4 plus charge. Oxygen, we know it gains two electrons, so it has a two minus. So again, think about that least common multiple. If you have to, think in your head about those puzzle pieces, if that makes it easier, because we did that activity in class. But the least common multiple of two and four is four. So in order to have four plus, we need one. So that would be SN. And then in order to have a minus four, we'd need two oxygen. So SN, O, Two. Okay, look up the charges for the rest of these elements. Aluminum would be three plus. Chloride is one minus. So in order to make a neutral compound, we need the least common multiple of three and one is three. So we need one aluminum and three chlorines, AlCl3. This last one is ammonium sulfide. Ammonium, hopefully you recognize from your reference table, your polyatomic ion chart. Ammonium has a one plus. Sulfide, because it has that IDE ending, it is from sulfur. So sulfur will gain two electrons. So it has a two minus charge. The least common multiple of one and two is two. So in order to get a two plus, I'm gonna need two ammoniums. Remember with a polyatomic ion, we write it in parentheses and put the subscript on the outside, and then one sulfur. Here are a few more for you to try. Look them up uh, on your periodic table and your reference table, and then try them yourself. We'll go through them in class tomorrow. If you have questions, let me know. See you in class.